Mm. Okay, so this is um, this is joint work with Tom Dieter and John Shaw Taylor, uh, who both also at UCL, and it's about um, defining captures, structuring input space, and doing it quickly. Okay, so the, the general is that we have a space X um, and we have to define a term on that space X, which captures some notion of intrinsic structure and data that's drawn from that. Common examples are, for example, the manifold structure and data drawn from some distribution. P on X um, has some manifold support. So, for example, in this, in this picture, you might want to find a kernel that learns that point A and B are more similar than points. A and C, even though points A and C are much closer in the kind of um, ambient um, space. Uh, or alternatively, you can view a kind of particular kernel whose norm in the RKHS has some um, notion of the smoothness of functions with respect to that submanifold. Another kind of structure you might want to learn is cluster structure, and then a third different kind might be, um, for example, finding structure in a state space in reinforcement learning. Um, that's defined by transition dynamics on that state space, for example. And uh, so we kind of quick checklist of, of general kind of things that we want to achieve. We want it to be a very kind of modular general approach that's applicable in lots of different areas and algorithms. <laughs> so obviously kernels are very general to that. So just learn a kernel can be modularized and applied um, in various domains. We want it to apply on, on very general spaces X, including continuous spaces. We we'll do it quickly, so we'll see in a minute that actually learning structure like this um, often requires a lot of data to do it robustly. Um, so we want to be able to use lots of data efficiently and process it efficiently. We want it to be very automatic, so we don't have to tune lots of parameters or have excessive domain knowledge, for example. Um, ideally, we want a, a single bandwidth parameter um, so a few parameters, just one bandwidth parameter would be ideal that would define a rich hypothesis class. Um, so I should say that, that there is a solution to this problem um, due to Sindhwani et al. in 2005, um, but this is essentially very slow um, and that's basically the problem that we solve in this paper, so speeding, speeding this work up. Uh, I should also say there are many methods out there to actually speed up specific semi-supervised learning algorithms, which is a related area, um, but I don't think there's a kind of general scalable method. Okay, so just a bit of notation. So if we have a kernel on our space X, um, just defining the RKHS in the normal way, um, and just notationally the inner product and um, norm on just subscripting of the K. And this is how I'm just defining uh, the pseudo inverse of a matrix. Okay, so an additional uh, important preliminary is a notion of um, an intrinsic regularizer. So given our, given our space X and a set of uh, points V drawn from that space X and any uh, function which maps that set, of, that set X to the numbers, we're going to define um, the bold vector H, um, the point evaluations of this function H on this set V. So that's given by equation one, point evaluations. And <clears throat> given any positive semi-definite matrix Q, uh, N by N matrix Q, um, let's also define this uh, regularization functional, um, these functions, so just the quadratic form. Uh, and certain kinds of, of, of regularization functional, I'm going to call intrinsic regularizers, which is when they're designed to measure some notion of smoothness um, with respect to some intrinsic structure in the space. So they're all, um, you know, not, not defined terms at the moment because there are different kinds of um, structure and different kinds of smoothness that you might want to learn. So a, a very common typical example is when you're learning a manifold on your in, uh, in your space. So here typically we'd have um, our, our set of points V would be drawn from some distribution on our space whose support is some submanifold of that space. And what we want to do is learn a, 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 a smoothness functional that kind of captures the smoothness of functions over that manifold. And a typical way to do that in um, in learning is to um, first define a graph on our points um, V. So typically we do that by just connecting very similar points, so nearest neighbor connections, for example. And in a sense, this graph will learn the manifold. And if we define our um, regularizer Q to be the graph Laplacian of this graph, 
then our intrinsic regularizer will actually be what's called the smoothness function. <laughs> so this is a very natural measure of the smoothness of functions over that graph. And uh, related, related functionals converge to a natural measure of the smoothness over the manifold. So I should point out that um, often this kind of construction is, is very sensitive to um, problems if you have a small amount of data. So you can short circuit your graph by connecting um, dissimilar points, for example, which you ideally wouldn't want to do. So it's much more robust if you can use lots of data to actually do this construction. <coughs> Excuse me. And going back to our original problem then, so there is, which is to define a kernel on the whole space which captures this structure. So there is a solution out there, and that's due to uh, Sindrani et al. in 2005. So their setting is that they have a basic kernel on the space, X, they have their subsample V, they have their intrinsic regularizer, and they define their kernel in a, in a very nice way, so they just uh, redefine the norm, the, the inner product in the, in, so they define an inner product in um, a new ARC HS, so they basically redefine the inner product to, to incorporate some intrinsic regularizer component. So you, you'd see that the norm in this ARC HS, um, if Q were a graph Laplacian, for example, would have, because of this term, um, a notion of this smoothness functional in the norm. So good points are obviously that um, this is an ARC HS. So this, this inner product define, defines an inner product in an RKHS, so you get all the nice properties of working with an RKHS. And you have a closed form solution for the, for the form of the kernel, given by equation 5. Um, and the only problem really is that um, computing equation 5 is cubic complexity because of doing this non-sparse matrix inverse here. So that's really the only problem. And that's the problem that we essentially solve in this work. So, so that's the problem, and the solution essentially is, um, once you've noted that, that um, it's intractable essentially because of computing this non-sparse matrix inverse, the kind of obvious strategy is to use a smaller, a smaller matrix, which is uh, essentially using um, the following strategy. So the first step is to, um, instead of measuring functions at the whole set um, V, so you might have a huge set of points V, rather than actually measuring functions at that whole set, you measure functions at a smaller set of landmark points. Um, so this is typically going to be much smaller, and just notationally, I'll define a point evaluation on this um, landmark set with, with a hat. Um, and the, the problem then is to actually look for an intrinsic regularizer on the um, point evaluations at the landmark points. So that's equation 7. And once you've got that, you can just follow this construction of Sindrani and define a new RKHS, which will be much faster to compute. So a very important thing to note is actually, you know, we're still defining a, a regularizer Q on the whole set V. So, on the, on the, so for example, a graph on a huge vertex set. So we're still we're not throwing away this data and just defining a regularizer on a subset. We're actually defining a regularizer on functions over the whole set V, and then trying to. So the problem essentially then is to find a an intrinsic regularizer on the small landmark set that captures what the regularizer, what the, the large regularizer is doing on V. So essentially, we get the robustness of building a large graph on the on this potentially large set V. <coughs> and so the question is, what's the correct uh, intrinsic regularizer on the landmark set? And I think this follows immediately from this kind of general theory, which just um, is a duality between regularizers and kernels. And so the example, uh, so this is proved, for example, in Smolin Condor in 2003. Um, but it's actually an example of a much more general duality that I think was proved before. So essentially it's saying that if I have an RKHS of uh, functions over a finite set, so I have an RKHS of functions over that finite set whose norm is given by um, this um, form in involving a matrix Q, then the that's, a that's a reproducing kernel Hilbert space and the kernel is just the pseudo inverse. 
Um, so the kernel corresponding to Laplacian regularization, for example, is the pseudo-inverse of the Laplacian. So this is just a, a, a matrix, a simple matrix version of a slightly more general theorem. Um, and so this, this theorem actually tells us that the equivalent, we're actually looking for a, a um, we're actually looking for a regularizer Q hat on our landmark set, but this theorem will tell us that equivalently we're looking for a kernel on the landmark set. And to get our regularizer, we can actually just invoke this theorem two times. So it will tell us, first of all, that the pseudo inverse of Q is a natural kernel on this set V, and therefore the restriction of that kernel to the landmark set is a natural kernel on the landmark set. And our regularizer is then straightforwardly just the pseudo inverse of that, um, that kernel. So that's all really straightforward, and essentially once we've chosen that, that um, regularizer on the landmark set, you can just define the kernel by equation 9. So that's exactly the construction of Sibuani, but with a, a smaller landmark set and a smaller regularizer. And we have uh, a closed form, exactly because, you know, for the same reason that we have it in the earlier case. And so this is the closed form for the, that kernel. So the important point to, to mention is obviously we're still building this huge graph. For example, if, if our original um, regularizer Q is a graph of potassium, we're still building a huge graph on this set V. Um, and an alternative interpretation that gives a bit of insight into this inner product in equation 9, so this is actually also equal to um, the following. So the inner product between functions h and g uh, is actually given by first measuring h and g at the landmark points and then interpolating those measurements to um, v using our kernel uh, as a pseudo inverse of q. So we know that this is a kernel on the whole set v. Um, once we've kind of defined the strategy of just measuring points at a smaller subset, in a sense, that's a kind of best estimate of their value on the whole vertex set V. And then we just define the, the kernel using those interpolants, so the smoothness of the interpolants. Okay, <coughs> and in terms of the complexity of actually computing this kernel then, which is the whole point of, of doing this, the important step is um, we have to find this kernel, which is the pseudo inverse of Q hat, on the landmark points. And to actually do this, we can appeal to this very uh, celebrated theorem of Spielman and Teng, who will tell us that actually computing. Um, so if, if our matrix, if our original matrix Q is badly dominant and sparse, so for S for our element, solving a single linear system in this matrix. Um, has actually nearly linear complexity in the sparsity of um, the matrix Q. The first thing is immediately um, this perhaps that we can um, compute an approximation to our um, to the kernel that we want on the landmark set. So we can do that in nearly linear time if Q is sparse. And that's an approximation in matrix 2 norm, or the spectral norm. Uh, and that's a theoretical result, but in, in practice this really is fast. So there are um, methods now out there to actually do, that use the ideas that go into the, the theorems used to prove this, and Spielman and Teng to actually do this, and in practice it really is kind of linear. Okay, so just to kind of summarize the complexity then, so we have a, a one-time nearly linear cost to actually compute this kernel on our um, landmark points, and then a one-time n-cubed cost to actually invert this matrix, and all of that then gets stored in memory, and any kernel evaluation is then order m squared. So there's actually two, uh, so the complexity depends upon two numbers, so the, the actual size of the first lar potentially large set of points on which you build a graph, uh, and then the number of points in the landmark set. And the complexity is actually cubic in the number of points in the landmark set, but it's only nearly linear in the um, size of the graph. And so the obvious benefit we get is the benefit of the robustness of being able to use a huge graph and avoid things like short circuiting, for example, um, but the whole thing is efficiently computable.
Um, another kind of neat thing is that um, this, this viewpoint that we've adopted um, gives a kind of quick and easy way to do parameter selection. So one potential problem with this kind of construction is that we're introducing additional parameters. So we might already have some parameters to do with the construction of our regularizer <coughs> Q hat, or the original regularizer Q, and we're actually introducing a couple more here, sigma and eta. So this would like, be a bandwidth parameter, for example, and this controls a trade-off between intrinsic regularization and the norm in that space. Um, but essentially what we're actually doing here is trying to ex extend the kernel Q plus from V to the whole space X and that just gives an easy way to do cross validation. So we just pick a um, subset and use a kind of criterion like that to essentially cross validate those two parameters before we actually apply it. So before using it in an SVM or whatever. Uh, okay, so finally just some experiments. So we, we first of all looked at some supervised learning and used this in um, uh, with LAP SVM. So here we've kind of built k nearest neighbor Laplacians. Um, and uh, for example, this graphs on the MNIST data. <coughs> so we compared, uh, so as I said, we use this in LAP SVM, so just using, using that kernel in an SVM essentially. Um, and building a, a nearest neighbor graph. So in MNIST, for example, the number of um, that's the number of kind of points in V is actually 64,000, and the landmarks at um, just 250. And um, so this is this is the the error. So this is uh, along the x-axis is the training sets, the actual late, the amount of labeled data, and the test error up here, and. Um, what we compare to is a kind of sanity check, um, which is the green line, is just using LAP SVM but throwing away a lot, uh, most of the data and just building a graph on the 250 um, points in the landmark set. So obviously you want to kind of make sure that using all this additional data is actually doing something better than just throwing it away and building a graph on 250 points. So this, the gap between green and blue here demonstrates that you know, you're really, you, by defining a different kind of regularizer on the landmark set using the whole graph, you're doing um, better than just ignoring that data. Uh, and this is this is a, the complexity. So this is the complexity of actually once you once you have your regularizer Q on the whole um, vertex set, so the original set V. This is the complexity of actually computing. Um, the kernel. So this is this is the original construction of Sindarani, which is obviously cubic, and as you'd expect, gets very difficult after, say, twenty thousand points. Um, and th these two lines are two different ways to calculate the um, the linear system. So the yeah, and that's essentially really is linear in practice. So on, on clustering, um, so we looked at. Um, clustering two moons data, for example. So we looked first at trying to do that with just k means using Euclidean distance, and obviously that has no notion of the kind of intrinsic structure of that space, so it doesn't separate the two moons. This is the um, general construction of Sindhwani using all of the data, all of the um, set to measure functions, and then this is with a much smaller landmark set. So there's a so this more or less recovers the, the performance of, of the full kernel version. Uh, and then finally, so this is kind of a, <coughs> um, a bit of current research. So this is kind of what I'm working on at the moment in terms of extending this. So this is a kind of another interesting application is to reinforcement learning and control. And here the problem is to um, find useful structure in a state space uh, for reinforcement learning and control problems. So in reinforcement learning and control, you often want a value function to be smooth with respect to, for example, the transition dynamics uh, defined over your state space, or just manifold structure in that state space, for example. So that would, that would be an assumption, and if you're using a kernel method, obviously then you want your kernel to um, respect the topology of defined by the transition dynamics in the state for example, our state space here is um, a maze, so the task might be that an agent has to um, get from one part of the maze to the other, and we'd be using kernels to represent things like value functions, and obviously you therefore want a kernel to 
having according to the transition dynamics in the space. So given that your ambient representation is just coordinates, a Gaussian kernel wouldn't do that, and that's just a picture of the Gaussian kernel on, on this state space propagating value along through the world, essentially, totally ignoring the topology. But this is an example of the data-dependent kernels that we've defined, and this obviously propagates value in a really nice way through the maze. Um, I think that's it. So just in, <coughs> in summary, we've defined kernels to capture various kinds of structure in, in different kinds of spaces um, in a very general way, so applying and applied in lots of different um, domains. And the point is we can now do this quickly, so it's near linear complexity in the size of a graph that you build to capture that structure. Um, it's all practical and automated, so there's kind of nice cross-validation in there, and etc. And there's really three ingredients. So there's the general construction of Sindwani et al. There's this kind of duality between kernels and regularization operators, um, and um, the, the, spa, the the fast linear system solvers of Spielman and Tang. I think once you have, once you know those three ingredients, um, it's really you know fairly straightforward just putting them together and, and coming up with a solution. Um, so hopefully the extensions to our reinforcement learning will be soon, and uh, I'll be putting software on my website, but it's not there yet. So that's. Hang on. It's, that's just a random sample. Well, if your data set's tiny to begin with, there's, the there's no... Yeah, I haven't actually tried any other um, okay. any other method. So I think that that, that would, yeah, I, I, I guess that in certain situations you could probably do better than uniform sampling. Um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't tried it. I mean, in terms of like proving what, that that would be a good thing, I think might be quite difficult. So just taking uniform samples, obviously, that's that's a, a representation of your original distribution of the data. Um, in the in the reinforcement learning stuff, um, it would be a kind of uniform sample in the state space as well. But yeah, I mean that's definitely an interesting kind of um, thing to look at. Whether you can actually do better, yeah. I think there are, there are actually other works that actually do not not using this method, obviously, but um, you know this notion of of selecting a landmark set to in this kind of setting, so in semi-supervised settings is already out there. So there are, there are methods out there to kind of pick landmark sets. Whether that applies here, or not, I don't know. But I guess one thing, uh, in the spirit of that, one thing you could try is maybe uh, selecting the support vectors. So doing one training and then taking the support vectors from the classifier landmarks and sort of doing another training based on that. Um, right, I'm, that's right. I'm just curious, it, it's, it's a weird representation that's specific to the classification. Um, whether it would work better or worse might be an interesting uh, uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I'm, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, or even independent, yeah. independently of it. I mean, well, it don't you think you would intuitively need some sort of like maybe a root end growth or something to adequately cover the space of these points? I mean, if I have like a million points versus 10,000, I would probably need far many more landmark points. No, I mean, the, the landmark points should cover your, your, the distribution, right? So the support of the distribution. I mean, if if you have a billion points or a hundred billion points, that, that number shouldn't actually change. So I would say that the, 
I mean, I don't know because you know I think you'd need to do some theoretical analysis, which I haven't done yet. But intuitively, it's it's a good cover of the space so that any point in the in the support of your distribution is close enough to a landmark point, and that that's not that's not a function of the the original and number of points that you're given. Yeah. 